turn with me this morning to Genesis chapter 32. Genesis, the 32nd chapter, we're going to read verses 22 through 31. And if you're with us this, this morning and able, I'd invite you to stand in honor of the Lord's word. Jacob got up during the night, took his two wives, his two women servants, and his 11 sons, and crossed the Jabbok River's shallow water. He took them and everything that belonged to him, and he helped them cross the river. But Jacob stayed apart by himself, and a man wrestled with him until dawn broke. When the man saw that he couldn't defeat Jacob, he grabbed Jacob's thigh and tore a muscle in Jacob's thigh as he wrestled with him. The man said, let me go because the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I, I won't let you go until you bless me. He said to Jacob, what's your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name won't be Jacob any longer. Israel. Probably you have a footnote in your Bible that takes you down to the interpretation of that name. It says something like this, God struggles or the one who struggles with God. Because you struggled with God and with men and one. Jacob also asked and said, tell me your name. But he said, why do you ask for my name? And he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Peniel because I've seen God face to face and my life has been saved. The sun rose as Jacob passed Peniel limping because of his thigh. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated this morning. So today is our, our third Sunday in walking through the story that changes everything. Thanks for those of you who've been participating and joining. And I have to say, it's, um, you know, we're just a few weeks into this, but it, the word I would give to it is it feels, it feels weighty. Um, not just because it's, it's been a fair amount of work to keep um, doing it, but more, more than that, it, it, it feels weighty, um, important. Uh, a sense of God speaking to us uh, through, through all of the word in this season. Uh, I, I would invite you, if you haven't had a chance to jump in, uh, we, we only have one more day tomorrow in G Genesis 49 and 50, and then Tuesday we start into Exodus, and we'll be in Exodus for 14 days. Um, I don't know if you know this, I have some affection for the book of Exodus. Um, I, I, I think I mentioned it a time or two uh, and so it would be fun if, if you haven't jumped in, if you'd like to jump in, uh, we're going to have some fun with Exodus. But this morning, uh, one of the challenges in doing this has been to try to think about what text do we want to concentrate on each Sunday as we worship together. Um, as I look ahead, uh, that gets challenging because after we get out of Exodus, we get into Leviticus and Numbers, and, and it it will be a different kind of challenge to decide what are we going to look at each Sunday. Uh, but I'm looking forward to that challenge. Today was really a challenge, though, because we've been in Genesis 12 through 50, which is such an amazing portion of the book of Genesis. Genesis 1 through 11 takes us from creation through the Tower of Babel, but Genesis 12 through 50 are those amazing stories of the four generations of matriarchs and patriarchs taking us from Abraham and Sarah, or Abraham and Sarah, all the way through four generations to Joseph and the way God used him to not only redeem his family, but to save a whole group of people in the midst of a massive famine. It's about how God's promise weaves its way through the ups and downs, and, and there are ups and downs. Uh, it is such a soap opera of a family, like sands through the hourglass, so are the days of our ancestors in faith. Right? So powerful. But as I tried to think about what, what's the right text to, for us to reflect on coming out of that section of Scripture, there were just so many to choose from. And I came close this morning to, to thinking about 
some of actually the minor stories that get told in Genesis 12 through 15, 50 that we sometimes overlook. And they are important stories that exist on the margins, if you will, of God's people. And they, they do a couple of things. They remind us sometimes that those even outside of God's distinct people sometimes turn out to be more righteous than God's people themselves. And oftentimes, they are there to remind us that sometimes we as God's people do some pretty terrible things to some folks and create damage and heartbreak and destruction in the lives of others. The stories I thought about there, I, I almost took us to the Hagar story this morning. Such an interesting text about how Abraham, Abraham and Sarah have this, this promise upon their life to be the father and mother of many nations, and yet they can't have a baby. And they get frustrated with that. And in their frustration, they decide maybe the way to do this is through Hera, Hagar, through Sarah's handmaiden. The problem, of course, is that oftentimes when God's people get frustrated because they're supposed to be a kind of birth happening in our midst that isn't happening, then we go try to find people who maybe aren't part of the community and drag them in so they can maybe help us have some life. And that's what Abraham and Sarah do. And, but once she's able to do that, it turns from blessing to frustration and, and she is, in a sense, used up and sent out of the community. Part of what's so beautiful in the story is that even though Abraham and Sarah so often overlook her name and just describe her as that slave girl or that servant girl, God comes to Hagar and the first word out of God's mouth is her name, Hagar, where have you come from and where are you going? And she names the God who speaks to her, the God who sees me. And has a promise for even Hagar. I'll just say, in light of Pastor Appreciation uh, Month, I kind of give this speech at some level to the staff every year that I try to make a promise on your behalf. I hope it's okay, but I'm going to keep doing it anyway. That we will do our best not to Hagar any of them. Uh, some on the pastoral staff will be here for a long time, but some won't be. Some will just be here as part of the journey of their ministry. And their job is not to, uh, not for Josh since you're on the front row, for Josh to come and help give birth to a youth ministry that we somehow can't figure out how to do on our own. But we don't really care about Josh's future or the hopes and dreams and purposes that God has for Josh. And so we as a church just use him up with little regard for his future. You aren't that kind of people and we won't be that kind of people. Amen? <laughs> Amen. So I thought about Hagar. Um, I also thought about Leah. Um, that story where Jacob meets Rachel and falls in love with her, but then he also ends up with Leah. We'll come back to that in a moment. But, but Leah just embodies the one who oftentimes just feels unloved, unvalued. And she too has this amazing story where God sees this one who, who Jacob doesn't really see. And he loves this one who Jacob doesn't really love. And God brings a flourishing and a, a blessing in her life. I also thought about Tamar. The problem is I can't really read that text on a Sunday morning in front of children. Um, or in front of some of you. Tamar is this odd story and this odd character who, who marries one of the sons of Judah. And we're not told in the text what displeases God, but God kills her first husband. At least that's the story she tells. <laughs> that was a joke, by the way. Uh, but given the laws of leveret marriage, she ends up with the next brother, but he doesn't really want an heir, and so he doesn't help her give birth. So God kills him too. Strange, but Judah's a little worried about giving another son to her. <laughs> um, 
But the story is about those who so often in our world wonder where their security and their next meal is going to come from. And so they act in ways that seem kind of suspicious to us at times and maybe a little shady. But she acts with as much creativity and it is creative. No question about what she does. It's creative. Read the text if you don't know the story. So that her future can be secure. But the truth of the story is her future would be secure if God's people would have done what they ought to do to make sure that her future would be secure. And so I love those stories from the margins and maybe we'll come, down, come back sometime and deal with them in more detail. But there are three major narratives in Genesis 12 through 50 that we could spend a lot of time on this morning. And they really are, in many ways, the pillar texts of Genesis 12 through 50. The first is Genesis chapter 22, where Abraham is called to take Isaac up to Mount Moriah and to sacrifice him there. Scholars sometimes refer to it by its Hebrew name, the Akedah, which is a Hebrew word for binding. It's the only place in the Old Testament where that word is used, the binding of Isaac. This time through, it was the first time I noticed the parallel, first of all, between chapter 21 and chapter 22. In chapter 21, um, Sarah, a little nervous about her welfare and future, gets up and commands that Abraham take Hagar and Ishmael and send them into the wilderness. And so Abraham, the text says, gets up early in the morning and takes Hagar and Ishmael and sends them into the wilderness where they will likely face their mortality, face death. But as they go into the wilderness to face death, the messenger of God meets them, speaks to them, tells Hagar, look up. And when she looks up, she sees this well of water that becomes the opportunity for sustaining the life of both Hagar and Ishmael and speaks another word of promise into Ishmael's life. In chapter 22, it's no longer Hagar making the demands, but God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son whom you love, and go into the wilderness and sacrifice him there. Go to the wilderness to face his likely death as well. As you know the story, when he goes into the wilderness and as Abraham begins to ready to sacrifice Isaac, the messenger of the Lord says, look up Abraham. And when he looks up, he sees that God has provided a ram. God has provided the sacrifice himself. What I find so powerful in that story, and if you're taking notes this morning, what I think is so important, and that was so clear this time going through it, is that Every time God appears to Abraham, there is this pattern. God comes and makes a command or a call upon Abraham's life. But then after God makes that command or that call, God then makes a promise to Abraham. So the command and the call comes then with a promise from God. And once Abraham hears that promise and is assured of that promise, then Abraham obeys. Did you follow that? There's a command, there's a promise, and then obedience. But what's so mysterious about Genesis 22 is that here's the pattern. God commands Abraham to go and sacrifice Isaac, and here's the weird part. He does it. We got command, and then we got obedience, and after Abraham obeys, then guess how it ends? He gets a promise. So what's so powerful about the text and what's so amazing about Abraham and his faith and why it gets, I think, captured even in Christian imagination as Paul writes Romans about how Abraham becomes a model of faith is because at this point in Abraham's journey, he no longer needs the promise to be able to obey. In fact, he's even willing to give the promise back to God because he has come to a place in his relationship where he trusts God so much that if God commands, even if he doesn't understand, he obeys, and then the promise comes out of that obedience. Oh, that is so good, and I should have preached on that today. And I love that text. The only problem with that text is I... No offense to you, but I don't see me in that text, and I don't see a whole lot of you in that text either. That text becomes, I would say, aspirational for Israel. They hope to get to that place where they can trust God so much that they can respond simply because God has called and commanded. I'm not there. 
The other really cool text that we could look at today is at the very end, Genesis chapter 50. I love the story of Joseph. Joseph, as a young guy, has these dreams, and dreams make their way all through Joseph's story. And he has those dreams, and we've talked about it before, but I love that Joseph hasn't learned yet that there is such a thing as an unexpressed thought, and he tells his family all the dreams that he has. Even though it's not hard to interpret these dreams, they're about how his brothers and his, even his mother and father will somehow bow down to him. Joseph understands. I mean, he has so much self-assurance that he's going into life and he's going to be significant and he's going to be the best of the whole family. And it's clear to everybody, isn't it? And I even think this text, forgive, all the, forgive me all you Gen Zers in the room, but this is such a good Gen Z text. He even has a helicopter father who before Joseph has even accomplished one thing in his life, gives him a participation coat, gives him a coat of, of great authority. He's not done anything yet, but he gets all that honor. It's so brash. His brothers aren't real happy. They sell him into slavery. And Joseph discovers this unique call that God has placed upon his life it comes with a great deal of challenge. And I think so much of the Joseph story is for the Judeans later who see in Joseph the model of what it means to be faithful even in exile. What it means to be a faithful promise even if the culture decides it's going to go a different direction than we would like it to go. How do we live as faithful presence? But here's the part that's so powerful about Joseph. By the end of the story, he realizes that the dreams that he had at the beginning were really not about him at all. That's the problem. Not just that he has a big mouth, but he misunderstood. He thought these dreams were about his elevation, but what they were really about was about God's purposes in redeeming not just Joseph's family, but the entire surrounding world of Joseph. And he can make that bold claim at the end of chapter 50, you intended this for evil, but God brought good about in it. Again, I love this text, but I too think it's aspirational. I, I love my life that I get to spend with college students a lot during the week. And this week I, I was in Kansas City with seminary students. Most of them are early days of ministry. Their tails wagging, excited about what God has for them. I got to speak to a group of uh, young people who are here at NNU for the weekend um, yesterday who are here kind of exploring the call of God upon their life and what does that mean. It was so fun to get to meet with them, but they're so young and idealistic and excited about what God has for them. And the problem is, I mean, there's, there's something so wonderful about that, but, but it's fun to deal with young people who have all these dreams, but it's hard not to think that those dreams somehow are about you. And so it's so beautiful, as we will do this week in celebrating Marvin's life, to also get to participate with folks kind of towards the end of our journeys. We're able to look back and say what we thought was a career and what we thought was us trying to make something of our lives was actually God using us in powerful ways. And what's so cool is, as will be the case as we celebrate Dr. Stalkup's life, the more we lean into the things of God, the more there is to kind of celebrate at the last chapter. Not of what we have done, but what, have, what God has done through us. But again, I'm not quite there yet. I see Joseph as so aspirational, and Abraham is so aspirational, but in many ways so unattainable. And that's why I just want to spend a few minutes talking about what I think is the central text in this section of Scripture, and certainly my favorite character. But fascinatingly, it is the text by which Israel understands its own life and takes their own name. It's the story we read of that weasel Jacob. Jacob comes out of the womb fighting, grabbing Esau's heel. He gets a name, and I'm sorry if your name is Jacob. It's not a great name in the Bible. 
just comes out grabbing heels, wanting to get ahead. Jacob has spent his whole life trying to become significant, trying to get ahead of others, trying to live a life that somehow will be affirmed by somebody. He would be so obnoxious on social media. He would just post every day wanting the whole world to affirm his life. Trying to get ahead, trying to be noticed, trying to get blessed. Cheats Esau out of his birthright, cheats Esau out of his blessing. You probably know the story. He flees and <laughs> meets Rachel at, a, at the well, oh, Fifi, and falls in love. It turns out his father-in-law is even a better cheater than he is. So it's such a great, funny part of the story, the cheater getting out cheated. But the text that we read, Genesis 32, is at this point, point in Jacob's life where he now has all kinds of kids and all kinds of flocks and he doesn't need Laban anymore and he's really had it with Laban. And so he's getting out of here and he's going home. But here's the problem. He knows that as he goes home, there is going to be one major problem as he goes home. Esau. For Esau was angry, rightly, vengeful, rightly, and had sworn that when Isaac dies, he's going to kill Jacob. And so as Jacob takes all of his stuff home, he realizes, I'm getting close to home. Uh, we could see Esau any moment now. So in the chapter before, he sends out spies to go see if, if anybody can see Esau anywhere. And the spies come back and say, bad news. Esau's coming, and he's got 400 men with him, which is not a pastoral appreciation welcome party. It's a sign that there's going to be bloodshed here. So Jacob does what Jacob does when your top, you know, when your top gift is stra strategic, right? Like he, he just goes into Jacobness. And he goes, oh, here's what I'll do. I'll send wave after wave of gift, and maybe that will appease Esau. That's a good plan. Then he does the most weaselly thing. He divides his family into two and thinks, well, if, if Esau sees us and kills half of us, maybe the other half will survive. And then notice what he does in this text. He's divided everybody in half, but now he takes his family, takes them over the river where they, where they will be in the line of fire and sneaks back over the river to hide by himself. What a weasel. And what happened? A man or God or Esau or the divine presence, somebody says, are you ready to rumble? Bing! And a wrestling match starts taking place in the middle of the night. Many Old Testament scholars wonder if the ambiguity in the text, is this God or is this human, is this Esau or is this the unique presence of Yahweh, is meant to be ambiguous because perhaps, like Jacob, all of our paths of brokenness, the things we don't really want to talk about, the parts of our character that we know are there and we try to hide, are often the very places where God meets us and has a wrestling match with us. They wrestle all night. The one Jacob is wrestling with says, let me go. All right, let me go. The sun's about to come up. And Jacob asks for the thing he's wanted from the very beginning of his story. I'll let you go, but you have to bless me. Bless me. This unique divine presence doesn't give Jacob a blessing, but asks a question. What's your name? Now, I assume God knows his name at this point. So it's not so much a question of, I don't really know your name, would you tell it to me? It's a question that asks this, who are you? 
What's your identity? What are you about? To which he tells the truth. I am Jacob. I'm a heel grabber. I'm a schemer. And rather than getting a blessing, Jacob gets a new name. The one who has wrestled with Jacob says to him, you are no longer a scheming, heel-grabbing cheat. You are the one who wrestles with God. Jacob even sees in himself a Jacob, but God sees an Israel. And out of that transformation, and here's what's so cool, after this wrestling match is over, Jacob, now Israel, limps, but he limps right into the next chapter, which is his encounter with Esau. And when Esau sees him, read chapter 33 this week, it's so beautiful. They slobber all over each other. They don't fight, but they grieve, and they weep, and they hug, and and there's this beautiful moment of reconciliation, but the text is quite clear. Esau does not forgive and reconcile Jacob because of the gifts that he sent. In fact, Esau doesn't want them. But what draws this reconciliation is that Esau sees in this former brother who was so audacious and striving to get ahead, he now sees a humble, limping, transformed Israel in front of him. And in that, somehow they both proclaim that they see the face of God. And out of that wrestling match, a whole new identity is formed as the striver to get ahead becomes the one who strives to know God more deeply. I find this text so beautiful. I love Abraham's taking Isaac to Moriah, but that's so far from the faith that I that I have. It's a beautiful aspiration, and I hope to get there, but I'm not there yet. And I love Joseph being able to say, I was working so hard, and now I realize all of this was God at work in me. I can kind of feel that one coming, but I'm not there yet. Jacob, I understand. And I think this text is so important to God's people and so important to us. Because there are some here this morning who you need to know this. God is never going to let you go. He's going to keep coming to you in your fears. Coming to you no matter how broken and messed up and conniving you make your life. He's going to keep coming to you and wanting to wrestle with you. That's a given, we Wesleyan types, we call that provenient grace, the God who just will not leave us alone. The question is not, is God going to wrestle with you? The question is, are you going to wrestle with God? It's tragic when, when we give up. It's tragic. We can just kind of give up and, and quit wrestling, but we can also, so, so often in God's peop- among God's people, we are so convinced that we've had this figured out for so long that we, we quit striving with God a long time ago. And in the process, started using the Hagars and the Leahs and the Tamars in our lives. What God desires is not a people who have it all figured out, but a people who will not striving with the stri- God who strives with us. A people who are curious people who desire to know God better, a people who want God's blessing, but he just keeps changing your identity. And he wants us to strive with him until he has made all things new in us. And so today, O Jacobs, 
God will not stop until he makes us his Israel. Help us today, O oh God. Have mercy on us um, for our lack of interest, our lack of curiosity, our settledness. Sometimes I, I think you have more luck with the Jacobs, the real Jacobs in the world, because at least they're willing to fight and wrestle and struggle. And so thank you today that you do not give up on us. Oh, how we want to have the faith of Abraham um, that can respond to your voice and re- not only regardless of the promise, but even in ways that are willing to give the promise back if that's what you want. <laughs> we want that. Help us. Thanks for the passions that you put into our lives, the dreams like Joseph had, but may we, may we earlier rather than later come to realize that all of those dreams are really your dreams to transform the world, not to make our name great. And so may we too be like Joseph. But today we can confess uh, we're Jacob. And so wrestle with us, strive with us. Invite us to strive with you. And may we be a people whose posture toward the world is not one of assuredness or preparing for the battle that we are going to have with Esau. May we look less like culture warriors and more like divinely transformed limpers whose hearts and lives and characters are being changed by you. And may that be the place where reconciliation with those we have thought are enemies, may that be the space in which reconciliation and transformation begins. For we pray this in the name of the one who loved us too much to let us go. But in the name of the one who became flesh and moved into the neighborhood and took on all that we are in our Jacobness in order to transform us to be what you have created us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me?
This week, uh, I spent the week with some students thinking about Wesley's life and theology, and if you know anything about we kind of Nazarene Wesley types, we love the word sanctification. And one of the questions about the sanctified life, a a life whose holiness looks a bit like, um, a a bit like Abraham's and maybe Jacob too and, and Joseph. The question is, is this holy life, is it something that is, we sometimes call it a crisis. Is it something that happens to us or is it something that is a process? And we wrestled all week with that answer. The answer is yes. (laughs) If you have not stepped into the ring to wrestle with the holy God, inviting him to make everything that you are holy and belonging to him, step into that ring, but let me warn you. To quote C.S. Lewis, he is good, but he is not safe. And when you step into that ring, that is going to begin a process of that very presence of God wrestling with you. And I can't promise you won't limp a bit when you get out of that ring. In fact, you probably will. But you will leave not as Jacob, but transformed to be a reflection of who God is for the sake of the world. That's why this benediction is for us this morning. May the wrestling God who keeps making peace, may he sanctify us through and through. May our whole spirit, our souls, our bodies, may they be kept sound and blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he who keeps calling us, he is faithful. And his promise is that he won't stop wrestling until he completes this work in us. And all God's people said, amen. Go in his peace.